Let's pray. Lord, it is an incredible privilege to open up Your Word. We need Your help once again. We want to get it right. We want to understand Your teachings. We ask that You would apply this, Your Word, in each of our lives. That we would grow in our love for You and in our relationship with You and our witness to the world. And so we entrust this time to You now, Jesus. It's in Your name we pray. Amen. There was a man who had lived in the city all of his life. And he decided he wanted to to get a cow. Let's call him Mr. Buskell. The man. And so so he goes and he buys this dairy cow. And he thinks this is going to be great. We'll have milk whenever we want it. And after a while he goes, wait a minute, we're not we're not getting much milk out of this cow. And so he says, What am I what am I doing wrong? What's going on here? And so he calls a friend of his. Let's call him Mr. Amon. He says, Mr. Amon, I, I, I'm really trying to treat this cow nice. I, I'm trying to be friendly to this cow. I, 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 I you know, treat, treat her really gentle when I go to milk her. And, and, and what's going on? Because she's drying up. I'm not getting any milk. Mr. Amon, he's just kind of shaking his head. You can't treat her real nice. Because what cows need is not for you just kind of whenever you need milk to go get the milk. No, you have to go out and milk the cow consistently. At least twice a day. Some people even three times a day. Every day you've got to milk that cow because if you don't, it just dries up. And you don't get all the milk that you should get out of that cow from the cow. You know, God wants us to get everything we should out of our relationship with Him. But we can't just go to Him when we think we have a need. No, we need to walk with Him consistently in our lives if we're going to really know the fullness and the joy and the peace of our relationship with him he loves us he wants us to know him fully but the only way we will know God fully is if we are consistently walking with him in the power of the Holy Spirit now as we come to our passage today we want to remember the circumstances Jesus has been telling the disciples He's going to be leaving them. They've participated in the Passover meal together. We call the Last Supper. And in the midst of their despair, their confusion, He's trying to encourage them and challenge them and comfort them. He's told them of heaven in the early part of our chapter. That God seeks to use them for His glory. God seeks to have a relationship with them. They are to call out to the Father in Jesus' name. And now Jesus wants to assure them, and He wants to assure us as well, that though He is leaving, He's not leaving. Though He is leaving, He's not really leaving. He states in verse 16, I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper that He may be with you forever. 
that he may be with you forever. Wow. The Holy Spirit was sent by Jesus that we may know and enjoy our relationship with God. He sent him to us that we might know fullness and peace and love in our relationship with God. But if we're going to know that, we have to trust him on a daily basis moment-by-moment moment basis. We have to walk in obedience to what He has given to us in His Word. And I know in my own personal experience, I can't do that on my own. I have to trust God daily. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about this morning what it means to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so our main point this morning is this, that those who love Jesus will walk with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Those who love Jesus will walk with Him in the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit or walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? Let me give you a definition of this from... W.A. Criswell, he was a longtime pastor at First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. And he says, to be filled with the Holy Spirit means for us to be so controlled and motivated with the presence and power of the Spirit until our whole being is one perpetual psalm of praise and service to God. So controlled and motivated with the presence and power of the Spirit until our whole being is one perpetual psalm of praise and service to God. So if after we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we continue to yield ourselves to Him, we continue to say yes to God, we further and continually, consistently are submitting our will to God, yielding to Him, confessing our sins, asking Him to be in control of our lives. And we're doing that not just once a week, but on a daily or even moment-by-moment -moment basis. That's what we're talking about when we're saying walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I put that in a variety of ways because it's not just, oh, you've got to do this, this, and this. You can think of it in many ways, but it's, it's that yielding, that submitting to God. And doing that consistently, even on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, and saying, God, you're in control. You are the Lord of my life, and I want to follow you. Well, Jesus tells us in this portion of scripture, scripture several benefits from walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to look at today. Several benefits of walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the first is this. The Holy Spirit helps the believer abide. The Holy Spirit helps the believer abide. Now, the initial purpose of this passage is to bring comfort and encouragement. That's really the focus, at least here in the beginning, in John 14 to 16. Though Jesus is leaving, He wants the disciples to know that He is going to still be with them in His presence. And it's in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so He says again in verse 16, He will ask the Father to give another helper. Now the word for helper there is the word paraclete. It can mean a person summoned to one's aid. It may refer to an advisor, a legal advocate, a mediator, intercessor. John uses it in this way in 1 John chapter 2. But the Spirit's function is to come alongside or dwell within us to be our helper, our guide, 
to convict us, to minister to us in a variety of different ways. Just as Jesus did when he was physically on earth. That's the Spirit's role in our lives today. Many of you know Kathy. My wife Kathy is a para now at Woodland Park. It's really a great example of the Spirit's role in our lives today. Because what does she do? She sits alongside a student and is there for that student. If the student has a question or needs some help or maybe needs a reminder they need to get back to work, Right? Little conviction, little nudge. She's there. She's there. Sometimes she's a go between, between the student and the teacher. And she also helps the teacher and helps a variety of people in the school when they need help. The Holy Spirit is our helper. When we have a need, the one who helps give us direction or reminds us we need to get back to work. We've gone off track. It's interesting to note here that Jesus asks for another helper. Because he was the first helper. The Holy Spirit, and you see this in different places in Scripture, even here in this passage... The Holy Spirit takes up residence with us, but He is really the representative of Jesus or the triune God in our lives. And so when we are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, when we are yielded to Him in our lives, we are enjoying fellowship with God. We are abiding with Him. Enjoying His presence. Now, we see in this passage that not everyone will enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit. Only those who know Jesus as their Savior have the Holy Spirit residing within them. Verse 17, the world does not, cannot receive because it does not see Him or know Him. But you know Him because He abides with you and will be in you. The world doesn't receive or know the Holy Spirit. He doesn't take up residence in everyone. But he does take up residence in each person as they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. How comforting that is to know. If we're a believer in Jesus Christ, God lives within us. In the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus would not abandon his disciples. He has not abandoned us. Verse 18 of John 14 says, I will not leave you as orphans. You are not on your own. I will come to you. And I believe he's speaking about here when he comes at Pentecost, after his ascension, he comes in the person of the Holy Spirit, and now he is empowering the church. When we receive Jesus Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. And we have a relationship with God. Jesus tells us in this portion of Scripture that we have fellowship with God. We are in Christ and He is in us. And so let me ask you this morning, do you know that you have the Holy Spirit within you today? Do you have a relationship with with God if you are a Christian if you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior the Holy Spirit resides within you are you yielding to him are you allowing him to control your life the Holy Spirit helps the believer abide and then secondly the Holy Spirit helps the believer obey Jesus began this section with an emphasis on obedience. Verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Boy, that raises a lot of questions, doesn't it? Am I keeping his commandments? 
Because if I'm not, if I'm not seeking to walk with Him, do I really love Him? Do I really have a relationship with Him? The greatest evidence that a person is a follower of Jesus Christ is that he or she walks in obedience to Jesus. That will be important in a person who is a follower of Christ. But Jesus here is not talking about some kind of Pharisaic obedience. Not a a, a duty, an obligation. Oh, I feel so guilty if I don't do what I'm supposed to. That's not what he's talking about here. He wants us to obey his commands because of our love relationship with him. Because of all he's done for us and how much he loves us and how much he wants us to enjoy his fellowship and his peace and his joy. And we see this in in John 14, 21. It's almost like a, not a vicious triangle, but a vivacious triangle here. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. The more we love him and obey him, the more we grow in our relationship with him and the more he manifests or shows himself to us, the more we understand and enjoy that relationship with God. The word here for disclose means to manifest or show oneself, to come to view, to make known. In other words, if we really want to know God, in His glory and power and fullness and all of His love and greatness, if we really want that in our lives, we have to walk in obedience to it. As we trust and obey Him, He discloses Himself. We understand more who He is in His wonder and in His glory. Let me say to you today that If you're not satisfied in your relationship with God right now, it may be, it may be because you're not walking in obedience. That's a question we have to ask. If I'm not growing in my relationship with God, am I I really saying, what are the commandments He's given me that I'm to follow? Am I seeking to follow those commandments? We might say, well, well, I go to church. I I, I gave some money to the poor last year and to some other charities. Well, those things are good. Those things are right. We should do those things. They're necessary in our lives. But it doesn't mean that we're growing in our relationship with Jesus. Because why did we do those things? Do we, do we come to church because we feel guilty if we don't? Because, well, I, I grew up going to church and my folks I was a bad, told me I was a bad person if I didn't go to church. Well, it's good to be at church for whatever reason you're at church. But God wants us to be at church because we want to get to know Him better. Because we're thankful for what He's done for us. Because we want to submit our lives to Him and yield to Him and worship Him for who He is. That's when we're abiding with Him and growing in our relationship with Him. Jesus says in verses 23 and 24, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. You see how he wants it to be out of a love relationship. That's what he's shooting for. Out of excitement, out of thanksgiving, out of gratefulness for what Jesus has done for us. When we consider 
that the God is so powerful and awesome and great and mighty, and yet He loves each one of us. And He loves us so much that He sent Jesus to die on the cross and pay for our sins that we might have a relationship, not just know about, but we might have a relationship with the Creator of the universe. That's what we're talking about here this morning. We're not talking about checking off a list of do's and don'ts. We're talking about a relationship with Almighty God based on His love for us. And because of all that He's done for us, we can love Him and enjoy that relationship. But if we're going to grow, we have to obey. It's not on our own terms. Uh, That's the way our world wants it. I'll believe in God if I get to do what I want to do. And then when I have a need, when I have a problem in my life, I'll call out to God. And if He doesn't answer the way I want Him to answer, then I'll go try something else. No, if we're going to experience the fullness of a relationship with Him... We have to walk in obedience to Him. We have to get up and milk that cow even when we don't feel like it, right? It's that consistent daily, moment by moment, walking in the Spirit, submitting our lives to Him, walking in obedience that Jesus is talking about here. Author Andrew Murray writes, he says, if we do not keep His way, Our waiting on Him can bring no blessing. The surrender to a full obedience to all His will is the secret of full access to all the blessings of His fellowship. That's what Jesus is talking about here. And I believe that's why many in the church today are not experienced the joy and love and fullness of God because we want to do it our own way. We have to walk in obedience. And the Holy Spirit helps us do that. But we have to say yes to Him on a daily, moment-by-moment basis. The Holy Spirit helps the believer abide helps the believer obey. And third, the Holy Spirit helps the believer know the truth. Know the truth. Verses 25 and 26 read, These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, this is a very important verse with the idea of the inspiration of the Scriptures. Because what Jesus is saying here, He's speaking directly to the disciples and saying, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit for you guys is He's going to bring to your mind and your heart what I said. And it's by His power, under His inspiration, that you're going to be able to write those things down. That's what He's talking about. The Holy Spirit enabled the authors to pen the Scriptures. Remember, they're not understanding everything right now. They don't get it. But when the Holy Spirit comes... He will inspire them. We talk about the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Spirit will enable them to be able to write the New Testament. We read about this in other places in the Bible. Paul states this when he says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired by God. He's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in and through those whom God had write down His Word. Peter writes about this in 2 Peter chapter 1. 
when he says, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. That's how we got the Bible. The Holy Spirit was working in and through the human authors, but was inspired by God. He is the actual author of the Scriptures. And that's why it all fits together. It all works. We see the Gospel, the good news, and His plan of salvation throughout all of His Word from beginning to end. Now, of course, we want to say this morning that the Holy Spirit was not only to teach the disciples. He teaches us as well today. As we yield to Him, as we walk with Him, God is at work in our lives. But this verse specifically seems to refer to the inspiration of the authors of the New Testament. And that is certainly applied to all of the Scripture. But he does want to give us wisdom. He does want to give us truth. And we've seen this already in our passage back in verse 17. Because the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. The Spirit of Truth. Christians are to be people of the truth. Now this could get me off on a big tangent here. But let me just say, please note how important that is in our culture today. God believes in truth. God believes in objective truth. Truth is not just whatever you think it is and whatever I think it is. Truth is not just whatever is convenient for you at this moment. Truth is not made up as you go, whatever the situation is. God has given us the Holy Spirit, and think about this, truth is so important, He is called the Spirit of Truth. And we find truth in the Word of God. Jesus has already said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. In John 4, 24, Jesus tells the woman at the well, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. See, our culture says, do whatever you want. Make it up as you go. Whatever you feel like can be truth for you. That is not what the Bible teaches. His Word is truth. And if we're going to grow in our relationship with God, if we're going to experience Him on that daily basis, if we're going to walk in, In Him, we have to submit our lives to His truth, His commands in our lives. And to know the truth, what do you have to do? You have to get into the Word. And say, how does God want me to live my life? Remember who the devil is. John 8, 44 reminds us, when Jesus says, you are the father, the, you have your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. What does our world say today? There is no such thing as objective truth. I wonder who's behind that. And so we have to ask ourselves, am I a person of truth? Is truth important to me? Do I stand on what I say?
Am I like the politicians who make a promise or a pledge and then say, oh, it didn't matter because the circumstances have changed. Now things are different. I don't have to do what I said I'd do. Christians are to live in the truth, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, studying the Word of God and living it out. And God tells us if we will do this, we will know His fellowship. We will abide with Him. We will know the fullness of His joy. He will give us understanding of how we are to live our lives. And therefore, we will glorify His name. But we have to know the truth and walk in it. And the only way we can do that is if we abide in the Holy Spirit, walk with Him. The Holy Spirit helps the believer abide, obey, know truth. And then finally, the Holy Spirit helps the believer have peace. Have peace. In verse 27, we come back to what Jesus originally said in verse 1 in this chapter. John 14, 27 states, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled. He, just, he said that in verse 1. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. I know I'm telling you I'm leaving, but I'm really not leaving. You don't have to w worry. You don't have to fret. I'm sending you the Spirit, and He is a Spirit who will bring you peace. Not a peace of this world that's fleeting. A peace that can withstand any circumstance you have to face. Because I am with you. That's what Jesus is saying. We don't have to fear anything today because we can remember He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Whatever we face, He is here. We can know His peace because we have the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now many of us here this morning, at one time or another, in our lives have experienced that it's kind of amazing isn't it we're facing something we lift it up to the Lord and and the circumstances haven't really changed but God's changed us he gives us that peace which surpasses all comprehension well the disciples weren't getting it they, they still didn't understand what was going on Jesus wanted them to understand and, and why he needed to leave. And, and again, you, as we've talked about before, you can almost sense a, 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 see a, a, a sense of frustration here with Jesus. He says to them, if you really understood what was happening here, and if you really loved me, you would be excited about me leaving. You would rejoice that I'm going. Because I said I go back to the Father. And at the end of this verse, he says something that kind of, we stop and pause and say, wait a minute, what did he just say? Because he says at the end of this verse, for the Father is greater than I. Now some have taken this statement by Jesus and use it to explode the idea that Jesus is God. Because how could he be part of the, the triune God, part of the Trinity, and say that the Father is greater than I? Well, one, we take any statement in the Bible in the context of other things that are said. And Jesus is not, not now denouncing all that he has previously claimed concerning his deity and oneness with the Father, he said that many times throughout his ministry. So that's not what he's doing here. But what is Jesus doing here? What he is trying to do is get the disciples to understand 
that when he came to earth, he could not come in his fullness. He had to, in essence, leave his glory behind. Or cover his glory in his humanity. This idea is talked about more, which we don't have time to go into, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. When Jesus physically came to this earth, he was in a different fullness than when he was in heaven. And so, what Jesus is reminding them or telling them is he gets to go back to his Father and sit at the right hand of the Father to know the fullness of his glory. Nothing will be able, will need to be hidden when he goes back to heaven. He had to hide part of his glory when he came to earth because we wouldn't have been able to handle it. And so if the disciples would understand that, they'd say, yeah, Jesus, you, you didn't, it didn't, it didn't you, you were so humble to come and, and be with us and take on flesh. Go back to where you deserve to be. But they're not getting it. And he tries to give them more peace and understanding. He wants them to understand that this isn't something that, something that God is, is making up as he goes. It's all part of his plan. And he's telling them about it even before it happens. So it will help them in the future believe in who He is and what He's doing. But now it's time to stop talking. Because what needs to happen is about to happen. Satan, the one who has great power in this world, sometimes we forget that, he does have great power, is about to begin specifically his scheme against Jesus. But Jesus will carry out the Father's plan and go to the cross to pay for the sins of the world. Well, the disciples still don't get it. They still don't fully understand. They're going to forsake and desert Jesus in His greatest time of need. They flee from Him. But after His death, after His resurrection, and after His ascension, the Holy Spirit will come and they'll understand. They'll get it. And they will have that peace that Jesus wanted them to know and have. Do you have that peace today? Do you have that peace in your life? Because you get it? Not that you understand every detail of theology, but that you say, yes, Lord, I understand your plan and I have received you as my Savior and I know that though I may not understand all of theology, though I may not understand every detail of what's going on in my life right now, I trust you because I believe in your love and I believe in your sovereignty. And I know you have a plan. And I'm part of it. I want you to know this morning, God has not abandoned us. Sometimes in our culture it feels like it, doesn't it? But He does have a plan. I want you to know this morning, whatever you're going through in your life right now, whatever questions, whatever doubts, whatever concerns, whatever struggles... God loves you so much. He cares about you. But if you're going to know, really know His fullness, His joy, His peace, even in the midst of hard times, you have to yield to Him. The first step is receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. Is saying yes to Him that first time. Saying, yes, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sins. I'm not, I'm not worthy of that. I'm certainly not. 
but I thank you that you love me. And through your death on the cross, you paid for my sins so I could have a relationship with God. And so I receive you, Lord Jesus, as my Savior. That's the first step. But then all of us have to daily, on that moment-by-moment basis, yield to Him. Not when it just feels like, oh, I've got a problem, I better cry out to God. But regularly, daily, moment by moment, walking in the power of His Holy Spirit. Because as we do that, then we will abide. And we will learn how to obey. And we will walk in His truth and enjoy that relationship with Him that gives us peace no matter what in our lives. There are so many benefits for us right now in walking in the power of the Holy Spirit where we yield to Him. Let's pray. I don't know where you're at this morning as we come and we're all in an attitude of prayer. But I want to lead all of us in a prayer of repentance and of yielding to God. This is something I try to do on a regular basis, any time, and maybe several times throughout the day. Lord Jesus, I thank You so much for dying on the cross for me. I thank You that You love me so much. And You want me to have a vital relationship with You. And I'm sorry, Lord, because I've sinned. I've blown it again. But I thank you, Jesus, you died for me too. That your cross counts for me too. So I turn from my sins, Lord. And I turn back to you and I thank you, Father, that you accept me and receive me in the name of Jesus. That you're always there for me. You always love me. And I ask that you fill me, Holy Spirit, fill me that you would be in control of my life and I would continue to walk with you and know your joy and peace and love and forgiveness. Thank you so much for that. That's your promise. And so I just want to go forth now, Lord, worshiping you exalting you and praising your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much, Lord. You have so much for us. And we can walk with you every day. We love you and we bless you. In Jesus' name.